very happy to introduce Doug. Of course, most of you know Doug very well. Uh, but for those of you who don't, um, gosh, I've known Doug for 45 years, maybe since I was five years old. Um, met in London. He came there to uh, uh, interview Lang. He just published uh, a book called uh, The Schizoid World of Jean-Paul Sartre and R.D. Lang, which is one of the best books written about Lang ever. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, he's a philosophy professor in Melbourne at Universe, uh, University of Deakin, Deakin University. And uh, his specialization has always been Freud and existential philosophy. And of course, that's something that he and I uh, shared in common. We've been fast friends ever since. Doug even was crazy enough to move into one of the houses in London, Portland Road, just to really get the inside scoop on what Lang was really about. The only academic who ever dared to do that. And he somehow survived it without going nuts. And uh, he has uh, been coming to our Esalen meetings for years. Uh, unfortunately, since COVID, as many other people have uh, you know, taken a break, Doug has not been able to travel to be with us, but we are expecting Doug to be here next year. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, we get to meet him on Zoom. Doug always is uh, the one person uh, in our meetings who uh, does research on what Lang had to say about the theme that we adopt that year. As you've noticed, uh, most of us uh, do our own thing. Our meetings are really inspired by Lang. We're not here to talk about Lang uh, day in, day out. Uh, so we especially value Doug bringing Lang explicitly into the conversation. And uh, so this year, uh, the theme is what is healing. And Doug is going to share with us uh, what his research has turned up about Lang's views on that concept. So, without any more delay. By the way, uh, we originally scheduled Doug for an hour. We were going to have a half hour for breakout <coughs> sessions. We've dispensed with breakout sessions because our group is so small it's not really necessary. So we will go until half past six. Uh, so we'll get the full benefit of Doug's talk. Okay, Doug, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's 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 lovely to be here. It certainly is amazing to see this you guys all in this room, you know, which I <laughs> brings back some memories. So uh, it's really wonderful, and uh, you're all looking pretty literally laid back. Uh, <laughs> this is, see, we we have civilization here, and you have. Uh, Utopia. So I, uh, I, I, I hope uh, you're going to uh, hope this will this will heal everybody. I'm sure the I'm sure all the ex experiences at Esalen, uh, including the hot tubs and everything, heal heal all wounds. So um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm certainly hoping to come next year, and I do miss miss coming. A lot miss seeing everybody and all of that, but I must say the Zoom, Zoom with all the negatives, it's got some great positives. So, uh, and that includes being able to be here and to, to talk to, talk to you and uh, whatever, and being able to do this over the time with uh, you know COVID and everything. So that's been amazing. I haven't felt like I'm totally. Uh, Cut off. So I'll do get on to talking, get, give my talk about healing, Lang and healing. And uh, as Mike was saying, you know, I've been pretty well, I've been pretty involved with RD Lang certainly since I wrote, before I wrote the book on him in the 70s and before I went to London. So, but, but, so uh, ever since my undergraduate days in the 60s, I've take, uh, been taken with Lang 
and during 75 and 76, when I had the good fortune of spending a few months living in 74 Portland Road in London, the, the PA Philadelphia Association household that Hugh Crawford ran to the extent that anybody could run it. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and uh, that's where, as Mike was saying, that's where Mike and I met and we've remained the closest of friends for the ensuing. Not, I think it isn't just 45 years, it's about 48 years. Oh my goodness, it is, it's 48 years. And in the basement of the house was the headquarters, if you want to call it that, of the Philadelphia Association which Lang still actively chaired. Again, the word chaired, you know, was relevant because it was next to impossible to lead such an eccentric bunch of individualistic skeptics. Uh, in any case, Lang seemed constitutionally unable to keep many followers for that long. So uh, down there in the basement, it was like the Freudian unconscious. It was anarchic, timeless, creative, unconventional, unpredictable, though to some extent interpretable. It was really an anti-organisation, that's what I thought at the time, where rules were left at the top of the stairs as home to the PA's many seminars and workshops in the basement. There was always some activity, at least from the late afternoon onwards. When there weren't animated seminars from on dwelling or existentialism or psychoanalysis, phenomenology of asylum, even Lewis Carroll, if there weren't those seminars going on, there was yoga and meditation workshops and <laughs> general carousing taking place. Down there on the side, was Mike's office. He was, the, as we were saying, he was the secretary of the, as, as the secretary of the Philadelphia Association. And Bob Dylan had just, when I came, Bob Dylan just released his album, Desire. Remember that? And Mike played it all the time, for months on end. Uh, we, we all, and, and he played it like, he would, put it on, and then it would come to the end of the LP, then he'd put it back on, and he kept doing that. So it was haunting, and we always had one more cup of coffee for the road. I was beguiled at the time, and I'd been interested, as we we're saying, uh, uh, for laying for ages, and I argued in my book, The Schizoid World of Jean Paul Sartre and R.D. Lang, that uh, both Sartre and his disciple Lang started out from a schiz schizoid uh, problematic one, which nevertheless addressed very, very real, significant psychosocial problems in the modern world. So in the Portland Road basement by day, I found myself rummaging through some of the old PAR archives, reading Lang's very careful notes of... Uh, Sartre's works, like I remember being a nothingness, he just got just these long, uh, lots and lots of pages of notes. And at night, I attended uh, le lectures and seminars, including Lang's ruminative uh, lectures, which were quite wonderfully absorbing and creative. Of course, I spent some time with Lang and the other members of the PA, and I once asked Lang why his general influence was not that great. Of course, he was very famous, but the influence was the issue. He replied that there was no Langian technique. There was no Langian school. I'm sure he was right. There was no particular healing technique, but there was a philosophy. However, there was more reasons here. <laughs> Although he was charismatic, Lang's personality was such that he could not really sustain a movement with disciples. It was actually to his credit that he couldn't sustain a movement with disciples. It's the way, you know, it's not a good way, but it's, that's what happens in cultish sort of situation. And 
he did <coughs> he didn't do that. He was often narcissistic and could appear as a trickster, somebody indefinable and unpredictable. He was a skeptic at heart, and but he was no dogmatist. He was a chameleon who was not really graspable in his essence. People had very different takes on who their Ronnie was and what he believed in. It's hard today, these days, to conceptualise just how really famous Lang was at that time. In the 60s and 70s, he was the most famous psychiatrist in the world uh, and a wide range of groups wanted to claim him for their own, from young to old, from left to right, from yin to yang. Nobody owned him, not the left, not the anti-psychiatrists, not the Buddhists, not even the Philadelphia Association that he founded. But factors including the Vietnam War, the May 68 revolution, the counterculture, the pill, the time of sex and drugs and psychedelic music combined to make the zeitgeist for Lang to make quite a huge impact Although he obviously, as a general thing, he made a huge impact. Uh, although he obviously loved being so famous, Lang could not relish it properly as he was always frightened that he losing his identity by being categorised. He wasn't going to go down that route. So Lang was starstruck by his own image in a way, but he was overawed by his own reputation and role to an extent quite to an extent, but this was strange for such a serious student of such on self-deception. He seemed sometimes to have the delusion that he was R.D. Lang. However, fortunately, Lang was never reducible to his reputation. When Sartre was asked why he was studying Paul Valéry, poet, who his critics dismissed as merely a <coughs> A, bourge, a petty bourgeois intellectual, such responded that while it was certainly true that Valerie was a petty bourgeois in, uh, intellectual, not every petty bourgeois intellectual was Paul Valerie. I felt the same about Lang. While Lang no doubt had major problems like alcohol or drugs or narcissism or whatever, there can be no doubt that despite the problems, he made exceptional contributions. So what were some of these exceptional contributions? I think that uh, sorry about that, I, I pressed a, a button here, here, just a second. Yeah, here we go. I think his major contributions to healing lay in some of his own qualities, his general sensibility his approach and his philosophy. Perhaps apparently simple things like listening, respect, staying and sticking with a person, allowing them to be themselves and then move on from there in understanding what is going on in some form or other. That isn't the same as agreeing with the patient, but of healing as holistic the whole picture of a person. Although Lang's personal qualities may have laid the ground, his focus was on communications, psychological contexts of social groupings and their histories that the person's involved with. And throughout his very career, he focused on many things, on schizophrenia, birth, pre-birth experience, uh, the family, the impact of modern world of science and technology, yoga, politics, the impact of psychiatry, patients' rights, the vagaries of love, and many more. But there was a vital link which permeated all of them and which originated with what is central to such, and that is the distinction between two realms, the human and the non-human and the consequences of treating human beings as though they were objects or things. So that's the, 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 the point that, that he shared with such this idea of the human, that the division is between the human and the non-human. 
like such, <laughs> who began with the radical ontological division of the world into human and non-human, being for itself and being in itself, or existence and essence, or free and unfree, Lang took as his starting point that every human being was free and needed to be treated as a free agent, no matter how alienated they were. On this premise, it's inappropriate for, from his uh, point of view, or their point of view, on that premise that we're free, make choices, there are these, this, this big division, it's inappropriate to talk about human beings in thing language. Language about things or processes is never appropriate for ultimately understanding human beings. While Lang was influenced by many philosophers and analysts, the extent to which Lang was a thoroughgoing follower of Sartre's philosophy has often been under, underrated. And in fact, I don't believe that Lang could be fully appreciated without recognizing the central role of Sartre's philosophy in it for their starting points, which divided being into free and determined beings were identical. Without recognizing Sartre, Lang's allegiance to Sartre's standpoint, many of Lang's interests and perspectives appear unconnected and arbitrary. Lang's fascination with Sartre went back to his youth. David Cooper told me how Lang poured over Sartre's um, being enough this through many nights, black coffee at his side. Lang and Cooper published their summaries of some of Sartre's early, uh, or late, later work, I'm sorry, uh, including his critique of dialectical reason, which was published in 1960, in which Sartre wrote an appreciative foreword in 19, uh, it, 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 Sartre wrote an appreciative forward to their summary uh, uh, in 1963, and he wrote in this, and I've translated it, like you, I, and, and he said this to Lang and to, to his colleague at the time, David Cooper, like you, I, Sartre, think that we cannot understand psychic troubles from outside. I believe also that one cannot study nor cure a neurosis without an original respect for the person of the patient. I maintain, like you, I believe, mental illness to be the issue that the free organism in its total unity invents to live in an unlivable situation. For that reason, I attach the greatest value to your research in particular to the study that you have made of the family milieu, taken as group and as series, and I am convinced that your efforts contribute to our approaching the time when psychiatry will be finally human. Finally human. Quite a statement of values. Clearly, Sartre assumed that mainstream psychiatry treated people as things. Sartre took it as axiomatic that the human world was, the, was based on our praxis, our agency and freedom, and was irreducible to definitions of essences. Our being was always in question. Lang's landscape was essentially this our essential freedom, self-deception, experience, and its violation, the terror of the group that Sartre focused on later in his, in his uh, later work, fear and intrusion of others, mystification, being for others as hostility and objectification. First and foremost, we must understand the human beings as agents, as producers, as praxis. For Sartre, our behaviour was always intelligible and it was self-deception to ignore that. Since we started as agents who were condemned to be free, we, would, we could not escape our freedom. On the other hand, the non-human world was that of things, of identities, of essences and processes. Now, Lang <coughs> took the implication of Sartre's scheme very seriously 
which have important implications about healing. A science of persons and not of things was central in the divine itself. Lang's abiding concern was with the implications of the intrusion of natural, of natural science into the human arena, such as the scientific look or birth as an exclusively medical rather than a human event. For the schizophrenics of the divine itself, the fact that they were persons meant that they were free and, if they wanted, could produce potentially intelligible communications through their actions for Lang. Word salads were red herrings, produced to mystify others. They may also have helped to mystify their own selves. Lang, to, them, to themselves, Lang uh, claimed that the schizophrenics deemed by conventional psychiatry to be beyond all reason as victims of illness processes could be regarded instead as agents whose experience was potentially understandable intelligible and rational when seen as intentional acts within a context. They were using Sartre and self-deception as a way of trying to live in what they saw to be an unlivable situation. But why would one want, not want to be free? For Sartre, the answer was clear. With freedom comes responsibility which cannot be avoided. Lang almost certainly overrated the magnitude of the patient's choices in schizophrenia by, challenge, by, by challenging the role of the unconscious factors uh, as, as well as organic ones. He was left with little alternative, but he had tried to redress the balance a little in favour of the schizophrenic as human and acting meaningfully rather than merely as the victim of organic processes. The uh, idea of treating a patient with respect, listening and recognition as agents may not be sufficient for healing, but is in truth at least necessary to get onto the road of recovery. For such who's collected essays appeared as a series entitled Situations, Situation situations. All three human actions took place within a setting, within certain parameters, as though they were on a stage where, although the scene was set, the actors could script the actions. For such, all actions occurred within a structured context, which impacted in a specific way with a particular person. Like such, Lang always focused on context, context as a way of understanding those social events which seem to be irrational. If we situate the context, we may better empathise with the specific intentions of the free subject. Lang utilised the systems theory approach which the con with, which, uh, with a concept of meta-context, the context of a context, to understand the hidden rationality in a situation, especially because meta-contexts, by definition, were not observable. Lang completed the divide itself in 1956 before Sartre published uh, his uh, later work, Search for a Method and Critique of Dialectical Reason. After the violent self, Lang moved from an interest in the meaning of the intrapsychic life of the individual through a context of interpersonal space of two persons, which is self and others, instead of if they moved from the individual into the violent self to looking at, the spa, at, at uh, what happened in interpersonal space between, between them and the self and others which following the later Sartre is locatable within the group or family context. Insanity, madness and the family with, with Aaron Esterson and the politics of the family, Lang was interested in how the family constellation provided the context in which 
individual schizophrenic, schizophrenic experience could be understood as a rational strategy. For Sartre and Lang, the brute context existed within a society which was part of the context of what he called the social, the total social world system, which is in turn a part of the cosmos. In the politics of experience, 1967, Lang uh, understood the total social world system as providing the social context in which schizophrenia was an understandable, or madness was an understandable reaction. In knots and also in parts of that uh, politics experience, Lang even allowed for the possibility of mystical experience to explain seemingly irrational experience and behaviour in terms of the biggest meta context of all. Mysticism was about as far as contextualising could go, and Lang went to Salon to meditate in 1971. Of course, Sartre was too much of a rationalist to take Lang's uh, further move of situating the social world within the mystical. But the methodology of investigating particular situations illustrates Lang's basic approach and abiding project because, like Sartre, Lang appreciated individuals in their singularity at the same time as they represented something more general. Context for Sartre and Lang was the human equivalent in a way of cause in the non-human world, that to the extent that context provided the parameters of choice, we're all in Sartre's terms, universal, in Sartre's term, where everybody's, a, we're all human, Sorry, we're all universal singulars, universal singulars, where we can cross-reference an individual with his or her time. Lang was sensitive to and respected the unique experience of individuals whom he did not suppose that he understood because he was an expert in mental illness. When he wanted, Lang had an uncanny ability to hear and to empathise. Empathy, respect and listening are helpful for Lang's contribution to healing, but additionally, an understanding context is vital. Now, Lang was to psychotics in many ways as what Freud was to neurotics. Lang listened to their stories to help to understand their meaning in terms of wishes and intentions, not of organic processes. Challenging conventional mores and uh, approaches, Lang was, as Marx pointed out, in the Greek tradition of scepticism, where little or nothing was taken for granted. Dichotomies such as inside, outside, mind, body, self, other, society, individual, bad, normal, were, as he would have put it, Lang would have put it up for grabs. Philosophy, especially existential philosophy and phenomenology, suffused Lang's works with the clinical data gleaned from his work as a psychiatrist and analyst, as well as live material to uh, further explore the humanity or lack of it in the human world. Lang was particularly offended by the, by the stand of uh, Carl Jaspers and modern psychiatry that there was a category of human beings, psychotics, who were in their terms ununderstandable. That, that was the, terms, the, the term of uh, Jaspers. There was, according to Jasper, Jaspers, an unbridgeable abyss of difference between psychotics and the rest of us. Not that there weren't some obvious differences between psychotics and the rest of us, but they were, for Lang, a challenge rather than a bridge that could never be crossed. For Lang, whatever else it was, schizophrenia was always a social event taking place within a social context needing to be understood in order to situate the experience and behaviour of the psychotic. Whatever might be happening inside the person. Clearly, there were dramatic and significant events occurring outside 
in interpersonal space and outside that that in the broader social context. Lang was the major figure who helped loosen up the mindset of us in the normal sense and it as as normal us the normal versus them the bad. He was bent on searching for the interpersonal and social context of the di diagnosis of psychosis and its impact. Moreover, there was the issue of perspective. Radical, radically different consequences accrue from the initial stance of seeing someone either as a person or as an object or a thing. Since the observer was always part of the observational field, how, ca how one treated someone impacted on how they reacted and how they were seen. Along, the phenomenolo along with phenomenological uh, thinkers in general, for such, consciousness was never independent, but always consciousness of something. Uh, one stands determined what one saw. The phenomenology of ways of seeing is clear in Lang from the beginning. In the divine itself, he wrote, this is Lang wrote, man's being can be seen from different points of view and one or other aspect can be made the focus of study. In particular, man can be seen as a person or thing now, even the same thing, seen from different points of view, gives rise to two entirely different descriptions. And the descriptions give rise to two, two entirely different theories. And the theories result in two entirely different sets of action. The initial way we see a thing gives rise to all our subsequent dealings with it, end of quote. It's a fantastic quote, Arthur. The initial way we see things give rise to all our subsequent dealings with it. So, <clears throat> Lang took the implications of one's point of view much further in his later works and he made the concept of the normal itself a, a, a focus of investigation and critique. In other words, with the, uh, from just looking at the schizophrenic or the bad person as being a focus of investigation, it moved to normal people being focus of investigation. And that's epitomised in one of Lang's very best pieces, The Obvious, which was Lang's contribution to the Dialectics of Liberation Conference in 1964, I think it was, or 67, I don't know. 67. Uh, etymologically, the obvious, the word the obvious, is that which stands in front of us. The story Lang told about the woman holding her three-year-old out of a six-story window to show how much she loved him by not dropping him was for Lang an, an example of the crazed terrorism of hyper-normality. The normal set a stance course, Lang was so warped as to be anti-human. Normal stance was, could be anti-human. And remember, remember, this is during the Vietnam War and all of that. As not treating people with the respect and dignity appropriate to human beings, our reflex to obey, which was encapsulated in the Milgram experiments, was the result of treating people as though they were behaviorist machines. The double meaning of diagnosis, diagnosis, of as seeing through, as seeing through, or seeing through social reality, demonstrated the central issue that this perspective one adopted, as I was mentioning before, determined what one saw. Treating humans as persons had vastly different consequences from treating them as machines or things. So it's a really central issue in relation to healing. Like where do you start from? And if you don't take 
for granted the set of circumstances that set that are necessarily described, you know, initially. It depends what your stance is. In Lang's later work, the basically subjective and human was made to stand in stark, stark contrast to a technocratic and objective scientific approach. Thus, his interest in the birth process, uh, pre-birth experience, the way the mind has been seen in mechanistic terms and the technological worldview of knowledge without love can be seen in the context of Lang's interest in human agency as a primary explanatory uh, factor in the human world. After his uh, book Knots in 1970, he wrote a play, Do You Love Me, 1972, which was a self-indulgent book of Lang's uh, conversations. And then there was a self-indulgent book of Lang's conversations with children and another one of uh, this time of sonnets. But there was also The Facts of Life in 1976, where he investigated the possibility of pre-birth experience as providing a template for later seemingly unintelligible behavior and experience. He raised the question as to what would happen to our worldview if we allowed ourselves to think whether there was some degree of intentionality in life before birth. It also focused on pre-birth experience and the technological fix of psychiatry. Another book, The Voice of Experience, was later book, 1982, uh, ex discussed experience, uh, technology, psychiatry, and once again, the possibility of pre-birth experience. And his book in 1985, Wisdom, Wisdom, Madness and Folly, was an autobiography of his early years and his years becoming a psychiatrist. Now, Freud thought that slips of the tongue and other marginalia of the psychopathology of everyday life could provide us with important discoveries about the nature of the human mind. I think that for Lang, schizophrenia or madness played a similar role in providing a way into understanding the lost world of human experiencing, even in the most serious mental illnesses. I think one of the reasons that Lang so often felt he had been misunderstood is that his project was far larger than understanding schizophrenia. It's as though Freud was saddled with the discovery of Freudian slips as his major achievement. Freudian slips were a way station and not any kind of endpoint. I think Lang's endpoint is the role of the loss of the world of valid experience as a problem, as the problem of our age, that we are alienated from who we are. The whole human race needed healing. This has consequences for our view of the world beyond so-called normality, such as the place of science and, and how alienated medicine becomes when we think that it's an achievement for a woman to be able to read a newspaper while she's having a baby. Issues about the central denial and violation of the realm of experience in the modern world persist, persisted for Lang until the end of his life. His interest in Francis Mott's strange ideas about pre-birth experience, the importance of the voice of experience and its relation to the scientific look the asylum post uh, Kingsley Hall communities in London, which were all aspects of a living phenomenology, what we did to ourselves and others in order not to see what we experience. Scientific objective rationality systematically contributed to the destruction and the invalidation of the privacy of experience as providing specifically human data in his social phenomenology, Lang uh, illuminated a specific type of sensibility to experience a natural way of being alive to oneself and others 
which he felt had been lost. Of course, there was his last unpublished book about love, an issue which pervades his work. How is love between two human beings possible? If we love somebody, we love them as they are in their own being or isness. To love somebody for Lang is to leave them alone, in a sense, as they are in their unique difference from us. For Lang, the modern world seems seemed beholden to a soulless scientific knowledge without love. That's termed the uh, astronomer C.F. von Feisiger would uh, use, knowledge without love. How could a knowledge of without love yield a knowledge of love. From Lang's perspective, the only way to humanise science was for it to assume human premises. How was love possible in the modern world in which people seemed increasingly to be treated as objects? The name of the associate of the organisation he founded, he, you know, the Philadelphia Association, since in 1964, which was to deal with human distress, uh, was derived, the Philadelphia Association was derived from the idea of brotherly love. The, the, the Philadelphia Association's main concern was with people, as they put it, whose relations with themselves and others have become an occasion of wretchedness. And they, the TA said, to, their aim was to come to a better understanding of how we occasion our suffering and joy, of the ways we may lose ourselves and each other and find ourselves and each other again, end of quote. Lang was always concerned with the disjunctions between people which prevented simple natural love from occurring. For Sartre and Lang, no matter how alienated we humans are from ourselves or others, we are always free agents to some extent. The assumptions of science where it involved human, humans uh, demanded fundamental questioning for Lang since the starting points of the human and non-human approaches were radically different and thus led to different conclusions. Treating persons as things implied that one inevitably reached conclusions about things and not people. That was Lang's basic existential critique of psychiatry, which was a paradigmatic instance of a heartless approach he, uh, that, that no matter how humane was fundamentally flawed, flawed because it confused people with things talking about humans in non-human terms. That's why experience is such a basic datum for Lang and the violation and mystification of experience was always so important and why sensibility to the nuances of others' experience was so essential for him. Therefore, the underlying reason that Lang focused so much on the scientific look, on the heartlessness of psychiatry, on invalidation and the circles of deceit which lead to mystification, on the difficulties of love of oneself and of others, was the degree to which even inadvertently we treat others or ourselves as things instead of as free agents. Lang argued from the divided self onwards that there was the world of difference between treating somebody as a victim of processes or as a being whose actions were the result of intentions. Lang's approach was existential, phenomenological and exper exper experiential. Concepts such as ontological insecurity, invalidation and mystification of experience alienation from who we are and others are, the impact of deception were definitively human terms for understanding the human situation. In one lecture, I recall Lang telling of the impact on an elderly woman 
when she found out that her husband had been having an affair for 20 years. He, her <clears throat> whole sense of reality was destroyed. The problem was not so much the affair as the derealizing effect on her sense of <clears throat> who she was having lived with such a fundamental deception for so long. What perception or what person could now be worthy of trust? In his 1964 preface to The Divided Self, Lang wrote, Freud insisted that our civilization is a repressive one. There is a conflict between the demands of conformity and the, develop and the demands of our instinctive energies, explicitly sexual. Freud could see no easy re re resolution of this uh, antagonism and he came to believe that in our time the possibility of simple natural love between human beings had already been abolished, Lang said. During my 1980 interview about the human condition with Lang, he reminded me again of that comment and this is the passage from Civilization. Uh, and it's and it's discontent among uh, uh, and this is what uh, Freud said among the work, works of the sensitive English writer John Goldsworthy there's a short story of which I early formed a high opinion it's called the apple tree and it brings home to us how the life of present day civilized people leaves no room for the simple natural love of two human beings now, I think this passage indicates something central about Lang's own abiding view of the world, which was vividly expressed in the politics of experience. Lang's version, which is in many ways Lang's, could be seen as Lang's version of civilization that's discontent. It's no way, no way accidental <coughs> that Lang's last and unfinished work was devoted to the history of love. But while the regrets for what has been lost may be similar for Freud and Lang. Lang's view actually contrasts with Freud's. Lang was, in many ways, an irremediable romantic reminiscent of Rousseau, who argued for the natural goodness of men and women before their corruption by civilization. Corruption. And, and Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. So we cannot predict, Lang once said, the behaviour of animals in their natural state from the behaviour of animals in captivity. Freud adopted a tragic view of human existence, which assumed malaise to be inherent in culture. Freud, like Sartre, held an anti-romantic Hobbesian view of the human condition. Lang diverged from that, from Sartre's view on this, because for Sartre, Sartre, the problems of human relationships were not attributable to human history, but were inscribed in the nature of being for others itself. But for Lang, our problems lie ultimately in treating people as objects and not as human. I think Lang's view of human nature certainly is expressed in positive experience was romantic and were inherently and naturally good for Lang if only the world would leave us alone. Love was possible if not for the inroads of civilization. Schizophrenics might be in a better state if only psychiatrists wouldn't interfere with them and people would be more human if technocrats did not treat them as things. We get the sense of a simple natural state of affairs from which you, we have become estranged. On this view, we are, as the Scottish Christians of Lang's youth would have put it, corrupted. <laughs> Perhaps Lang romanticised what it is to be human partly in reaction to the prevalent ways of looking at humans in non-human terms. Not that he was a happy romantic, his strength lay in his stance as a sceptic who uh, challenged the presumption of knowledge by those who looked at humans from a standpoint appropriate for looking at things. Some of his popularity was in the questioning 
of established claims to knowledge, especially around <coughs> mental illness. His strict claim questioning uh, of uh, the impact of looking at the human world in non-human terms and in providing uh, glimpses of the possibility of a more human world where the relationships were a good deal more humane. But nobody could deny that Lang, in the words of one of his favourite philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche, would always live dangerously. For me, the vagaries, complexities, strengths and weaknesses of Lang's life and work can be summed up in another of Nietzsche's memorable phrases, Ronnie Lang was human all too human. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I uh, guess we lost some of our discussion time, but we got about 15 minutes or so. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, All right, that's it. Oh. Okay. No, I'm just waving to him to let him know what happened. Because he can't hear us. Oh, oh, can you hear us, Doug? Yeah, I can now. I'm, I'm putting it up now. Yeah, okay, yes, yes. Okay, uh, well. Hey Doug, it's Will, thank you so much. That was wonderful, as always. And um, uh, I'm just wondering, for those of us who want to learn more about Sartre, but maybe have some deficiency in our training and our studies is where is a good place to start other than learning French and diving into him, his own works is there a secondary text that might be a and I'm trying to make a shortcut so maybe it's a bit of a yeah, ins yeah, insulting yeah. question but what's it give, give us some guidance if we want to do more Sartre because he's the schizoid world of Jean-Paul Sartre and R.D. Lang. I'm asking uh, Doug here um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, you know what? There are there's there's various excerpts. I, I I think I think that believe it or not, that short uh, that short uh, piece he wrote it was a lecture in 1946 called Existentialism and Humanism does give a pretty good indication. Plus, looking at patterns of bad faith which were in the uh, in being and nothingness. And just looking at that, I think they're very good introductions. I think that, uh, I know that, uh, I don't know, I, I think it's still available, Walter Kaufman's Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre. It's a, it's a very good collection. They've got some of those, uh, they've got a couple of those uh, excerpts uh, from Sartre in, in, in that book, Kaufman, uh, the uh, existentialism from from uh, Dostoevsky to Sartre. So I would say the existentialism and humanism, and the patterns of bad faith, because I think the patterns of bad faith is uh, a very good description of of some of the ways we deceive ourselves and a sort of consistent view from his premises. So certainly I, I think uh, you can get there without having to read everything. I, I, I did have to, I had to read a lot of the stuff, had to read stuff before it was, it was translated. I think everything's pretty much translated now. Uh, Will French. was asking but, if uh, you had any secondary yeah. sources, Doug, that you could recommend, not just sorry. Doug, can you hear me? Yeah, well, sorry, what, what did you say? Will was asking if you could recommend any secondary sources about Sartre that might be helpful, not just um, yeah. writings of Sartre. Oh, Sartre. yeah, yeah, you read somebody who tells That's you the story of Sartre. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Well. There's a lot. I mean, it's just a lot. And, and I think you could go, you could get uh, 
sort of diverted, really. I think part of it is with such, I think, I think it's partly to get an idea of what he, of what, of, of his approach. And I think actually, uh, reading a novel like Nausea, La Nausea, uh, is, is terrific from that point of view. You know, it gives you an idea of, uh, it's very well written. And uh, it gives you an idea of uh, the sensibility that he had, that feeling about the sort of problems with existence, you know. It's, uh, I think all his, I think all his uh, dramatic and, uh, works and his story, you know, his, his uh, uh, short stories and the trilogy he wrote of uh, Age of Reason, well, mm -hmm. the trilogy which was there, sorry, with, with, with Simone de Beauvoir wrote about the history there. I mean, there's a lot of different ones. I, I don't know. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. And my follow-up question is there, there seems to be much less reading and interest in SART, especially in academic context. In, in my, when I was in school, in graduate school, there wasn't it was every one thing was the postmodernists and the post-structuralists, and it's very critical of Sartre. And do you think that the kind of decline of interest and visibility of Sartre reflect, reflects a kind of like a counter-revolutionary push because Sartre was so closely tied to revolutionary action and the upheavals of the time, and so a more conservative, um, depoliticizing, uh, kind of neutralizing postmodernism starts to come in instead. I, I, I would say no to that. I, I, I think it wasn't because of that. You know, for example, these days, even Franz Fanon is uh, being lauded. Uh, I, I think that, I don't think it's his revolutionary side, you know, where he'd go and hand out um, Newspapers, the Maoist newspapers, and uh, I think it was more. I, I, I think that harder. I mean, I think he, he was always very independent, and he couldn't be contained. It's a bit like uh, Lang that way. You couldn't kind of the left or whoever couldn't control him. I remember when he was he was asked to. Uh, he was speaking in the May 68 revolution, revolutionary times in, in Paris and he got up to speak and he had it to be for all the students during the revolution, aborted as it was. Uh, and uh, they, it was a note that said, such, be brief. <laughs> so they, uh, I, I think actually, uh, I mean, such could, could make philosophy out of anything. I think, in answer to that question about the postmodernism and everything, I think postmodernism taken over. I think the idea of personal responsibility and uh, uh, freedom and, uh, you know, in inexorable freedom, being condemned to be free, and the, the intentions of that and the tensions of and the idea of deceiving yourself, I think it's quite confronting for a lot of people. I think it's hard to take in a way. Uh, I think he, he, he really was pretty key on uh, agency, you know, that was the big thing. And I think, I think these days agency is not so uh, uh, sexy, you know. Uh, it's like, it's easier to blame the system, for example. And Sartre never did. Sartre would always say the system is, you know, is a problem and all that, and he would have his views on the nature of the social system. But there was, he said, we're not lumps of clay. We could always make something out of what's made of us. You know, it doesn't matter what the situation is, we are responsible in some way. It's interesting, you know, like Freud said, we're responsible for our dreams because they're ours. Uh, and Sartre says we're responsible for our actions no matter what. And I think that's a stern thing 
it, it, it may or may not be quite right, but it's, it's a, a position that stands to my way of thinking in opposition to the, current, to the more current idea of blaming, you know, the system, whether it's, or it's, it's, it's your, whatever, with, with gender or race or, or it doesn't matter what, all of those things. And Sartre was, was very much uh, interested in uh, politics all his life, and he was, you know, he's very much a left, left politician, political person, I mean. But uh, he always took the individual very seriously. And the problem was, in his later work, that the individual, that, that the individual was caught in his, in uh, the, uh, uh, in the web of their own create, of everybody's creating, uh, even though you're responsible for what you do, but you can't control it that well. You know, it's, it, and you don't even know. You, if you're mystified, it's your fault, it's not your fault, but it's you that's acting. But if you're mystified, uh, you can't see the way out. You know, you can't even see, you, even through a glass darkly, you can't see it. So it's, it's a very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult uh, circumstance uh, to be in where you're confused. You know, we're almost out of time. Let, let's uh, get another question in before we're, we're done. Can you hear us? I think so. Oh, uh, Doug, he was just saying we're almost out of time, so we're going to get one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Doug, Sandy. So could you extrapolate Hi. further? I know you can. On um, your understanding of Sartre's idea of bad faith. And can, can you speak a bit louder, please? Can extrapolate okay. Sartre's idea of bad faith and how that relates to therapy. Oh my God, I didn't get, I didn't, couldn't hear, I couldn't uh, back out the question. You, uh, what can you hear me? I don't know, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can hear, yeah. I'm yeah. loud here, I don't know about I am there. I so. can repeat it for you. The, yeah. Uh, he's asking, uh, Sandy's asking, can you extrapolate on uh, Sartre's idea of bad faith and how it applies to therapy? Right. <sighs> yes. Yeah, okay. I knew yeah, you, I well, knew you it was a fundamental idea of his that we uh, are deceiving ourselves about our, uh, about, not, about not being free. We're free, you know, we can't escape, we're condemned to be free, we can't escape our freedom, uh, and <laughs> from his point of view, uh, a lot of times, if you're in therapy, you, you would be denied your role. Like the important thing for him would be to look at what your role is. Uh, well, not you, the therapist, I mean you, the patient. You know, what your role is in creating a situation that you're in. And you've got to start off with that and then you start to see uh, what you're deluding yourself that you, uh, it, it sort of needed to happen in the particular way your life has developed. Whereas actually, from there, for such, you could go back to your original, to your, not original trauma, but more like an original choice. And it comes out a lot in the case of uh, Jean Genet. Uh, you know, he wrote a book called Saint Genet, Saint Genet uh, actor or martyr, Bart and he said that, 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 that even though Genet was conditioned to be uh, a thief, he could see the situation and he decided, decided to, uh, to uh, overcome that and to become a writer and not to be 
not to be uh, subject to the script that was written to people. In other words, it's a bit like I, I, I'm mixing the kind of terms because I think there, I, I, I think that uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, the main thing was that you had to face your own freedom and how you deny your own freedom and how you deny, and how you make ineffable choices which and you can come to terms with what choices you have made or the choices you are continuing to make uh, on the basis of that and so you, it's always to me it's it's the important beginning for such that as he said in therapy for the therapy of that is to see where you're not really not really confront the reality of what's going on in your life and you need to change change direction in your concepts of treating yourself as a person that's chosen this path rather than it being done to you only even though of course that's part of it is that so all right doug that's great yes we're going to stop uh we're out of time Thank you so much. And next year we'll see you here in Esalen. Hey, James, Next year in Esalen. That's what they say. Yes, indeed.